In this lecture of Analytics for Business and Economics, we're going to be covering regression models. In particular, we're going to talk about the process of estimating those regression models. Um, in the next lecture, not this one, but in the next lecture, we'll talk about model diagnostics and testing whether or not that model we actually get is a um, valid model or not. But for this lecture, we're really going to focus in on the mechanics of how to estimate and then interpret the output of that estimate. Okay, we're beginning our lecture estimating regression models, and we've got our similar setup. Um, I'll wake our studio back up here on the right hand side of my screen. On the left hand side of the screen, we have the um, lecture notes. Now, my lecture notes on the left hand side are going to be a little less dense than they have for the last couple of lectures because here we're really going to talk a little bit more about the mechanics of how to do linear regression. And in particular, um, we're going to talk about these mechanics in the um, in the context of a particular example. Here, we're going to use the um, data from your um, textbook on new parenting. So we have a new parent. His name is Dan, and we have some data on Dan. And as we all know, if you have um, ever had children or been around anyone with children, the amount of sleep that you get well, is not copious. Sometimes you lose a little bit of sleep in those first um, few years of life of your child. And well, we think maybe that has, a, has something to do with how grumpy Dan can be. Does he get more sleep or less sleep? Um, and we also, we know he has a new baby, so we wanna know, does the baby sleep matter in all of this? Okay, and we're gonna try to answer these questions with a simple linear regression. Um, now, those of you who maybe know a little more about modeling and whatnot, you might say, well, this is too simple a model. What about this? What about that? Well, that's not within the scope of this lecture right now. Within the scope of this lecture is really an, a, a um, basic explanation of the mechanics behind estimating a linear regression in R. Okay, so what is regression? Regression is using a methodology to find the best fit line through some data. All right. Now, I use the word line a little bit um, loosely here because we're going to talk about multiple regression a little bit later. And then if we have two variables, it's no longer a line. It's actually a plane. And if we have like three, four, or five variables, it becomes this um, multi dimensional plane or what we call a hyperplane. And so, um, and yeah, that has a full explanation in math and you can we can talk about it. It's just you can't visualize it. So we're going to stick to what we can visualize in this lecture. Um, even just two explanatory variables becomes hard to visualize, but we'll see that in just a minute. All right, so let's stick in here and regression is fitting this. So we're trying to fit the relationship to a um, between independent variables or our explanatory variables and a dependent variable, which is the variable we're trying to explain. So if we look at the example from the textbook, um, we'll find, and you can see there's a link in the lecture notes right here to the, the section in the, in the textbook. You'll find we have an explain, uh, uh, our dependent variable is the level of grumpiness that our poor new parent Dan has. All right, and that we're going we're gonna to label that variable affectionately Dan.grump, um, you know, because. And so we want to know how grumpy is he relative to how much sleep he got, and of course, how much sleep his baby got, okay? And so dan.grump is just basically an index. We're kind of asking him on a scale of one to 100, how, how grumpy are you? And then sleep and uh, baby sleep, those are both numeric variables. Those are measured in time, okay? And so that's what we wanna do. And ultimately what we wanna do is we wanna fit that relationship and then understand a little bit more about what that relationship is telling us, okay? So let's, Let's keep going, and that's probably not perfectly clear yet because I haven't fully defined what a linear regression is. I'll do. I'll, hopefully, I'll do that as we progress through the um, the lecture today. So let's start out with. I'm going to make my lecture notes a little bit smaller, and I'm going to make my R just a little bit bigger. There we go. And we need an R ch code chunk. So I'm just in an R markdown file, just like I always do with some notes. I've got the wrong date in here. So what, this should be like with the 29th or something like that. But hey, we're all good. So let's just keep going. And the first thing I need is my packages. So I'm going to load 
using the Pac-Man package, um, the Psych package, and the CAR package. Now the CAR package, CAR stands for Companion for Applied Regression. So it's perfect for the stuff that we're doing, right? It's got a bunch of different tools for doing regression analysis. And, you know, regression sometimes gets a little maligned. Oh, it's a linear model. Oh, you can't do this. It has all kinds of limitations. And yes, it does. And there are all kinds of really cool, better, fancier, cooler, whatever kind of er type adjectives you want to talk about out there beyond simple linear regression. But the bottom line is simple linear regression remains a very powerful and very useful tool that sometimes is the only tool you can really use given the data you have. Um, you know, if you don't have thousands of observations, sometimes it's hard to use some of those really, really fancy methodologies. So in any event, we're going to start here with this linear regression. Step one, we need to load our data. So let me go ahead, load this data. All right, I'm using the same command. I use load here um, because I have an R data file. Now, this is something that's really important to note. That load function, I can only use that when I'm loading a native R file. If I'm loading something else, I need to use a, a, a function that's designed to pull that in. So like, for example, if I want to pull in an Excel file, I need to use something like um, read XLS or um, read underscore Excel. There's a couple different functions depending on what package you use to bring in Excel. Um, the same thing with a CSV file, a comma separated values file. I need a read.csv is the base R function, or you know, there's there's other packages that do it a little bit nicer and faster and better. Um, but to be honest, unless you're doing something really really fancy with some with really really big data, you don't really have to worry about that. So the read.csv for all the stuff we'll do in this class would work just fine. Um, so. This load function, we're only going to use that when we have a native R file. But I've saved this as a native R file for you. Um, here's the URL to where to get it. All right, just makes it easier to get to. And so just like we've always done. And then it's always a good idea when you're loading data, when you load some data, have a quick look at it and make sure it came in the way you expected it to. All right, so, oh, well, crumb. I don't have Pac-Man loaded. I need to do that. So we might as well get that done. Um, I will speed that process up, though. Okay, Pac-Man package loaded, hooray. Let's go ahead and run this, this code chunk. Now we're loading the psych in the car package, awesome sauce. Then we load our data and then we have a look at it and here we go. We have Dan's sleep, that's how much sleep he got. So this is measured in hours. So 7.59 means he got 7.59 hours. I have no idea how long that is, but it's a little more than seven hours and 30 minutes. Um, so we have baby sleep. 10.18 hours. Well, you know, babies sleep a lot because that's what they need to do when they're first born. Um, and then Dan dot grump. All right. How grumpy is he? Uh, I believe this is on a scale of 100. Hooray. And then we have day and day just measures the day of the experiment. So if we looked at this full data set, we would see there's like 100 days. OK, and in those 100 days, um, uh, we have a reading for each day. Um, now that actually is probably important um, for verifying our model. I would hope that, that this function, this variable day doesn't explain anything. But if it does, it means we have a problem with our, um, with our experimental design. But that's for next lecture. So we'll leave that alone for right now. Okay, keeping on going. And I'm just gonna get rid of this for now. And we'll come back here to a new line. And the first, one of the first things we better do is we need to understand a little bit about our data. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to use the describe path, the describe function from the psych package. I like the describe function because I think it just does a little nicer job 
of formatting the output than summarize. Um, now I'm gonna set a couple of settings here. I'm gonna set skew to false and ranges to false, just because that's extra information. It clutters up the table in my opinion a little bit. And I don't really, really need those in this, this first thing. I really just wanna see the mean and the standard deviation and how many observations and whether or not we have any missing, that kind of thing. All right. And it also get, will tell me, like, for example, if one of these was a character value or factor or, or something that's not numeric, it would actually give me some indication that that's not numeric. All right, and we can kind of see what's going on. That's nice. Dan gets about seven hours of sleep. The baby gets about eight hours of sleep. And on average, he's, you know, you know mildly grumpy, I guess. Okay. That's why he's Dan the Grump. I don't know. In any event, there we are. So the next thing I want to do is I want to take a little deeper look at this. So for example, you might be yelling at me and say, wait a minute, what if there's skew in some of this data? I really want to know about that. Well, actually, this is where the next part comes in. This is another function that is in the, the psych package, although there's a version of it, of course, in things like ggplot and other places. But for right now, we're just going to use the one that's in the psych package because it's easy enough to use. It's called the pairs.panels or the pairs plot. All right. And you can see what it looks like over here. To do this, I'm just going to use the function pairs, P A I R S, dot panels. All right, pairs.panels. It's really easy to misspell it to do, you know, pairs.panel or something like that. It's pairs.panels. So if you've got the psych package going, this should work. If it doesn't work, really double check that spelling. And I'm just going to give it the data frame parenthood because the data frame saved inside this R data file is called parenthood. And we can see that right over here um, um, parenthood. All right, I can even click on it and view it in the, the R viewer. Although I have to admit, this R viewer of data is not my favorite way to look at data. Okay, so let's keep going. We've got our describe function. We have our pairs.panel. Let's see what this looks like. And what is it going to look like? There we are. Now, so so what's going on here? I really like this, this plot because it packs a lot of information. It's a little ugly, to be honest with you. I'm not sure I'd ever include it in, like, say, a publication. But, you know, I, you know, it, it, it presents a lot of information in a very small amount of space. The first thing, let's look at the diagonal. So on the diagonal, we see a histogram of each data, uh, of each of the variables in the data frame. And that's really handy. We can see things like skew, all right? Um, and if it's roughly normally distributed or if it has some kind of other weird distribution, like for example, I look at Dan's sleep, baby's sleep, Dan's grumpiness, you know, they're not perfectly normal. There's probably a little bit of skew in each one of them, but overall for normal data, or from not normal data, but data coming from the field, it's, you know, actual real world data coming from the field with only a hundred observations, I may tell you it's pretty close. It also draws in a line, all right, that line kind of is supposed to be an approximation of the, you know, the, the distribution of the data. I'm, I'm, I don't want to get too much into that. You just look at the overall shape. You don't see a lot of skew here. You don't see a huge outlier anywhere in there. You know, outliers, I, I, I would agree that a box plot would be a little easier to see outliers with, but you know, it just gives you a nice view of what the data looks like. There's nothing hunky going on here. But look at day. Day, on the other hand, is weird, right? It's just a flat, uniform distribution. That's weird data. What that tells me, if I didn't know that day was just measuring one, two, three, four, five, you know, which day in the experiment it was, um, if I didn't know that, this would cue me in that day is not a natural variable. It's it's something weird, and so we'll have to treat it differently. Okay, we could almost ignore day. In fact, we can almost redo this and and get rid of day from the from the column because we don't really need it as much as we need the other ones. Though on the other hand, there will be when we get to chapter the next the next lecture um, some usefulness to say, well, how do these things relate today? If they relate today in some way, then 
that might be a problem or an indicator of a problem. So let's focus in then on our, our dependent variable, um, Dan grumpiness, and our two independent variables, um, Dan sleep and baby sleep. So up here in the upper triangle, this is the correlation coefficient. So it's Pearson's correlation coefficient. And basically, the higher, the closer this is to one in absolute value, the more closely linked the two uh, the two variables' movements are, all right, or the more what we say correlated they are. In other words, they move related together in a certain way. So either if it's positive, they move in the same direction together. If it's negative, they move in opposite directions. But also, but they, you know, they move direct. One goes up, the other one goes down, kind of thing. Um, and so we we see that dance sleep and baby sleep. They move together, which kind of makes sense. The more sleep the baby gets, the more sleep Dan's going to get because Dan's a new parent. This makes sense. And at 0.63, you know, it's, it's reasonably correlated with one another. It's not too correlated, but it's reasonably correlated. Now, if we look on the other hand, Dan's grumpiness, negative 0.9 with sleep. Okay, the less sleep he gets, the more grumpy he is and vice versa. This this seems to be pretty, you know, that's that's a pretty strong correlation there. We see the same thing with baby sleep, just not as much. All right, we could go into some discussion of what that means, but we'll we'll talk about that later. Okay, now the bottom triangle of this gives us scatter plots, and I really like scatter plots because you know this correlation coefficient gives us an overall sense of how related the one variable is to the other. The scatter plot really visually shows us this. And we could see things like, for example, is there an outlier? Is it a linear relationship? All right, because this is one of the things we're going to have to check in the next lecture is, you know, is this data linearly related? And you notice, even though I said this lecture was all about the mechanics of doing a linear regression in R, we really haven't gotten there yet. We've just been talking about, you know, examining the data. But this is so very, very important. All right examining the data before you get started before you just start blasting away with some kind of statistical technique is really really important to in order to avoid making silly mistakes all right you know the kind of mistakes that get you fired because you know you shouldn't have made them um, all right so that's this paris panel i love this plot it's ugly it's really kind of ugly i don't like the colors and it's it's just really kind of ugly but it's got a lot of useful information in it. And so I, I, I tend to use this to start out with looking at a data set. So the next thing we're going to do, all right, is we finally now get to estimate the model. So let's talk a little bit about what actually we're doing. So linear regression or a linear model is essentially something we call ordinary least squares. It's by method of ordinary least squares. Right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to try to find the line that goes through. So in this case, we've got dan.grump and dan.sleep. All right, so we're going to explain dan.grump using dan.sleep. Dan.grump is our dependent variable. Dan.sleep is our independent variable. So let's come up here. If we look at dan.grump versus dan.sleep, that's I'm circling it now with my cursor. You can see it's one, two, three down in the first column of these scatter plots. Well, you can see that red line that goes through there. All right. So the, the psych package uses a little more sophisticated model than a linear regression, but let's just assume it's a linear regression right now. What we want to do is we want to find the line that we can plot through those points that minimizes the square, the sum of squared residuals, all right? Or we look at the line, we take the distance between each one of those dots in the line, square that, sum it up, and we want that to be as small as possible. That's why this is called ordinary least squares, or it's an ordinary method of finding a line that minimizes the squared error. Okay, and it's I think it's kind of an old-fashioned concept to call it call them errors, all right? They're the residuals of the models, all right? They're the part, they're the variation in the data that you don't explain, 
So basically it wants to fit a line such that we minimize the amount of variation in the data that we can't explain using a straight line. All right, that's theoretically what we're doing with linear with linear regression. So, well, the next thing that we need to talk about is, well, how to do that, and we're going to use the LM function. LM stands for linear model. Um, it took me a long time to get used to that because, you know, in many, many other packages, it's, it's labeled OLS, so ordinary least squares. Um, but, you know, linear model is the same thing. Basically, there are a set of assumptions, and we'll be checking those assumptions in the next um, lecture, that make ordinary least squares something called blue, or the best linear unbiased estimator. Okay? And so if you meet all the assumptions, there is no better estimator than ordinary least squares. And so that's why the linear model uses that. And so we put in here our formula to start out with, and that is we want our dependent variable. Dependent variable goes on the left-hand side of the tilde, and then on the right-hand side of the tilde is dan.sleep. Okay, and then we tell it where to get the data, data from parenthood, and we run that. Now, LM is a little like um, the AOV function. The output of the LM function is not very useful, so we need to store that as an object, and then we'll use the summary command to get a readout of, of what the estimate is doing. So let's do that, and then we're gonna go through what's going on here. Now, one of the things, there's a few things I really, really like about the way R puts this out, and there's a few things I think is, well, why did they do it that way? That's weird, um, because many, many other packages do it a little differently, but you know, that's okay. Um, we're just gonna talk through each bit of this um, so you have an idea of what's going on. The first thing it gives you here is called the call. All right, this is the command that you ran. So in other words, formulas dan.gump um, as a function of dan.sleep, data is parenthood. We just, just what we typed up here, basically. The next thing it does, and I really, really like this, is it essentially gives you the five number summary of the residuals. Now, what are the residuals? The residuals are the difference between what our model predicts, given the amount of sleep Dan got, Dan's grumpiness to be, versus what it actually was in that particular observation. Okay? And so we'll talk a little more about residuals in just a minute. I'm going to plot it for you, and you can kind of see what's going on. Um, but we're going to basically create a formula that uses takes dan.sleep as an as an input and spits out uh, its best guess as to what dan's grumpiness will be all right that's what that line all right so that's essentially what this line will be all right is what is that function such that i give it dan.sleep and it gives me an estimate of dan.grump okay um, but it's not going to be exactly right because you know the the dots are a little bit spread out. They're a little they're not all on a straight on a single line, and so the difference between what we predict or our y hat and what actually is y that's our residual. All right, it's how far off we are, and in fact it's probably y minus y hat. Although usually we square it, so I have a hard time keeping track of which way it is. Um, because the sign doesn't matter because we're going to square it anyways, but for most of our calculations. But, you know, it's still nice to know. Um, y minus y hat tells you <coughs> if it's positive, that means we undershot. If it's negative, we overshot. Actually, I'm not sure. It might be the other way around. Too. It doesn't matter. Um, in any event, these are our residuals. And it tells us the minimum, the maximum, the first quartile, the third quartile, or the 20 fifth percentile or 25 percent of the the points within these residuals are below negative 2.23 25 percent are above 2.681 and then the exact middle the 50th percentile is negative 0 0.399 all right so what are we looking for here because there's a little bit i know i told you we're going to do diagnostics in the next lecture but i can't help it you always have to be checking you got a model, that's great, but is your model BS? 
right? Is the computer lying to you? Because the computer will lie to you. You have to you have to interrogate it within an inch of its life. All right. Um, so what am I looking for? I want the minimum to be this close to the same number as the maximum, except one's negative, one's positive. All right here, 11.025. There, 11.75. They're pretty close to one another. All right. They're just on opposite sides of the zero line. Two, I want the same thing for the first and the third quartile. Here, negative 2.2, and there, positive 2.6. They're about, they're both about the same distance from zero. About. They aren't going to be perfect, right? But close. So that I, that that's reasonable to me. And the median should be very close to zero. All right. That's that's what I'm looking for in this this here where it's talking about the residuals. It, you know, unless there's something really, really goofy going on, this this will the, your model will pass this test. Um, but you know, yeah, there we go. The next thing we're going to come down here is we have our coefficient estimates, and so here's a big table, and I want to break down what each one of these means. But the first thing I want to do is I want to talk about the coefficients, all right, and their estimates. So here we have two coefficients we're estimating, or sometimes we'll call those parameters. I will oftentimes call these parameters. All right, so when I have a regression model, I'm always going to have my number of deep in, or independent variables plus one parameter, because I have an intercept. So here I have one independent variable, dan.sleep, and I have an intercept. And you always have to have the intercept, you just do, all right? Um, the only reason to leave, the, you you can only leave the intercept out if you have a really, really good reason to, and then put it in anyways, okay? So we have these two things. I want to talk about what this means. So I need um, to, well, I can do it right here, actually. Um, I'm going to I'm gonna type this out in, in kind of in a language called LaTeX, and, but it'll translate into math for you, so it'll show you what it means. So um, I'm going to put a double um, double um, um, dollar sign, and then I'm going to do y. All right, uh, let's see, slash hat y. And I'll do a double dollar sign. And you can see right down there, there's a y hat, right? All right, so it's going to keep, it should keep up with me. All right, so y hat, which is our Dan, our grumpiness of Dan, okay, is equal to, all right, essentially beta not, all right, so beta zero plus slash beta. You don't need to know LaTeX. This is, I'm just typing this so that you can see what I'm doing. Um, one, all right. And then we have, I, I like to just put it in parentheses, um, Dan dot Crump. Okay, I spelled it wrong, so that's okay. Um, I have capitals, and I don't think we have capitals in our, our stuff up here. So let me let me change that. And that's wrong anyways. All right, so let's change this. It's not Dan.Grump. It is Dan.Sleep. Why don't you guys let me get away with that? All right, name it. There we are. So there's that's the basic formula, right? Well, I now I have an estimate for beta zero, right? Or beta naught. It's 125.9 nine, point nine six. All right. I have an estimate for beta one. It's negative eight point nine four. All right, and I rounded there, and that's okay. So let's type that out. So this regression makes a formula. All right, it becomes an equation. And so I want to type this out for you real quick. And we're going to have basically, we'll put the hat over that, and we'll call it um, Dan dot Grump. Okay, that's my y hat equals my beta is 125.96. All right, now minus, because beta 1 is negative, right? So plus a negative is minus a positive. So we're going to do minus 
All right, times Dan dot sleep. All right, so the point is if I take and I put in and you can see, don't worry about the, the latex stuff, that's that's irrelevant. It's, it's, it's just so I can show you this formula down here. All right, if I take and I put 125.96 minus 8.94 and then say Dan got eight hours of sleep, I'll get an estimate for what Dan dot grump is. And that's what these coefficients right here for, or parameters are, that's what these are, all right? And so another way of saying this is, for every hour additional sleep Dan gets, he's gonna be 8.94 points less grumpy. Well, there you go, all right? Hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, you can make an appointment with me and I'll be happy to help you. All right, next, standard error. All right, this is an estimator, okay? Just like a mean, just like anything else, that means it's a random variable, okay? And for all you Bayesians out there, this is a frequentist approach right now, so don't worry about it, all right? This is a random variable. Um, and so it has a distribution or a spread, all right? If we did this, you know, this same experiment and a thousand different universes, I know I'm getting a little sci-fi here, but oh well, um, you know, I would have a spread. I would have different estimates. And my estimate of what the standard deviation of all of those different estimates would be is about three. Okay, so I can then use that standard error to calculate a t-value. Sometimes this is called, in, in many other programs, this is called the t-ratio. Because you'll notice it's 1.25.9563 divided by 3.0161. Gets you this 41.7. And then I can use that T statistic to test whether or not this number is significantly different from zero. And that's what this p-value is. All right, so this p-value is telling me, is this number significantly different from zero? And so we refer to that oftentimes as statistical significance. In other words, yes, we have statistical evidence that tells us that number matters. We can't just put a zero in. And here we can find we have strong statistical evidence to suggest that Dan's number, amount of sleep does in fact impact um, how grumpy he is. All right, we have very strong evidence, right? Um, so strong that R isn't even giving us the real number. It's just saying it's really, really small. Okay, cool. So that's what this table is. These significance codes, that's basically, this is um, um, hypothesis testing for dummies. More stars, more better. All right, so three stars is really, really low. Two stars is really low. One star is really low i should have added another really and then one star is um or a dot i guess i don't know which is which doesn't matter um is is getting bigger in any event i don't really like using the stars just look at the p-value if the p-value is less than your alpha then it's significant if it's not it's not there you go so next thing we want to talk about is this paragraph down here and the first is the residual standard error in other packages, this will be called the standard error of regression um, because it has two different interpretations. This is the standard deviation of all of those residuals. You know, your actual minus your predicted or your actual, actual Y or the actual grumpiness that Dan had minus how much we predicted, all right? Or the Y hat you know, that came out of this formula right down here, okay? Well, the standard deviation of those residuals, that's the standard error, that's sta residual standard error. That's what this is. But it's also has the interpretation of being the standard error of y hat, which is also a um, random variable and estimator. Okay, so meh, that's fine. Um, on 98 degrees of freedom. So our degrees of freedom is going to be our number of observations minus our number of explanatory variables minus one all right so we have k explanatory variables in this case one but we also have an intercept so we have it's 
basically our number of observations minus the number of parameters that we estimate. And the number of parameters are 1, 2. All right, so we had 100 observations. 100 minus 2 is 98. All right, next, multiple R squared. I guess I just, I've never understood what this word multiple means. Usually we just call it R squared. Um, Microsoft Excel also, when it spits out its stuff, calls it multiple R squared. I don't know. Um, we should probably have a whole lecture on R squared, but um, we don't really have time in this particular class for that. Um, but in any event, this tells us how much of the variability from the mean we're actually explaining. So here's the thing. I could take and I could just average how grumpy Dan is. I, in fact, I did that right up here. All right, so we could come up here and we could look at the average grumpiness of Dan and it's about 63.7. So I could just guess 63.7. How grumpy is Dan? 63.7, that's my guess. And that's how close I would be, 63.7. Or I can use this model to do so. And if I use this model, on average, I'll be 81 point, or, or I'll be 82% closer than if I just guessed the mean. That's basically what that means. So that's, it's how much of that variability we're explaining um, by our model. It is what we call a measure of goodness of fit. Um, and there's a lot of caveats on how to use R squared. The biggest problem with R squared is we can always get a perfect fit. If we want to, and we try hard enough, we can get a perfect fit, but our model will be bad. All right, we may not want a perfect fit. That's why I don't like calling the residuals errors. I mean, they get called that a lot in statistics books, but they aren't necessarily errors. They might just be noise. And filtering out that noise, that's what we want to do, right? We want to get rid of the noise and see the signal. So if it is just noise, filtering it out is good. It's not an error to leave it residual. It's what we want the model to do. So I think it's better to just call it is the, the those air those air terms or the, the difference between y and y hat the residual variability of, of y, right? In any event, so there we are. Multiple R squared tells us this. Adjusted R squared, I don't like adjusted R squared. Um, I don't use adjusted R squared for a very simple reason. Adjusted R squared is not a measure of goodness of fit. Adjusted R squared applies a penalty for adding in irrelevant variables. All right, so it adds a penalty for not being what we call parsimonious or having the simplest model possible. That makes it a selection criteria. All right, a model selection criteria or model information criteria. Well, I don't think it's technically an information criteria, but it is a model selection criteria. It's just not a very good one in my opinion. There are better ones out there, um, you know, depending on what we want. It's beyond the scope of this class to really talk about that too much. But in general, I think there are better measures out there to do what it does. And many, many textbooks do not discuss adjusted R squared correctly. They call it a measure of goodness of fit. It is not. Um, it is a model selection criteria. The biggest issue I take with it is there are better ones out there. So I don't generally deal with adjusted R squared very much um, unless I absolutely have to. The F statistic looks at the, uh, we'll talk about that in multiple R squared and multiple regression. And there we go. So we'll keep going. All right, next. The next step is, well, that's great for one variable, but we never need just one variable. We almost always want more than one variable. So what about multiple regression? So let's take a look at multiple regression. So we'll do another um, regression model. All right, we'll call this regression two. Okay, and here we've got our formula. And in fact, I'm gonna make this a little easier to read by putting it on multiple lines. Our formula is dan.grump as a function of Dan's sleep and baby sleep. When you're yanking formulas in R, the um, you know things like a plus don't mean quite the same thing that they mean you know in, in normal terms. Here, inside of a formula, this really is a bad, I think a better way to say that is and. 
So dan.grump is my dependent variable. Dan.sleep and baby.sleep are my independent variables or my explanatory variables. Okay, there's a few other um, um, syntax things that have to do with formulas um, that we could talk about, but for right now, we don't really need them. So we're just gonna stick with that. The final thing we're gonna do is we're going to summarize that model. And I'm actually gonna keep a copy of the summary because all that stuff that the summary function spits out, that can actually be saved in, a, um, in an object and then printed out. So let's go ahead and do that. And boom, we start to see almost the exact same um, stuff that we saw before. Um, the only thing is we've got another line here. So let's have a look at what's going on here. Well, our, our residuals stay almost the same. We can see this looks, this looks fine. All right, our inner step stays very close to the same. Our coefficient on dan.sleep stays very close to the same. And then we have baby.sleep and its coefficient's really close to zero. But if we look at the p-value, the p-value is huge. What does that mean? That means that the coefficient on baby.sleep is statistically insignificant or is not significantly different from zero. So what's the interpretation of that? The interpretation is this. Based on this regression model, we don't have evidence to conclude that baby.sleep adds significant amount of explanatory power over and above what we get already with dan.sleep. So basically, baby.sleep doesn't seem to be explanatory of Dan's grumpiness. Now you might be saying, well, BS, I call BS on that. And maybe so. I mean, maybe we got some much more complicated relationship where baby sleep affects Dan's sleep, which affects his, his grumpiness. And so we have some essentially collinearity. And we know we have that, or they're, they're, they're related to one another. All right, and we know we have that because, well, Dan.sleep and baby.sleep are correlated, although they're not too highly correlated. We could take another tack to this. Another tack might be that um, baby sleep is not highly predictive of Dan sleep because Dan has a partner. Um, and his partner shares in the responsibility of staying up with baby when, need, when it's needed, right? And so they go back and forth. And so sometimes the baby doesn't sleep and Dan doesn't get a lot of sleep, but other times Dan, the baby doesn't get to sleep and Dan does get to sleep, right? Because he has help. So who knows exactly how that works or why, but for right now we can say this variable is statistically insignificant. It does not contribute to information predicting movements in Dan's grumpiness. Now notice I'm not saying that Dan's, the baby sleep doesn't affect Dan's grumpiness. Mostly because with a simple model like this, I'm not sure I can make that conclusion. Um, but with the right experimental design, hopefully we can make some conclusions about how um, one variable affects another variable. Um, but we have to be really, really, really careful as we do that. Okay, let's keep going, and I want to come down here to this F statistic. All right, well, you can see the F statistic tests whether or not both the coefficient on Dan's sleep and the coefficient on baby sleep, basically all of the coefficients in the model except the intercept, we leave that one off, all right? But all of the other ones, it asks, are they all simultaneously equal to zero? All right, are they both equal to zero? And we handily reject that, that conclusion, okay? All right, so next, multiple linear regression. Well, let's visualize this. Now this, I have some code. You can see it in the, um, here in the um, lecture notes. I'm not going through this with you. Um, this, is, this is well beyond the um, scope of the class. But what I want to do is I want to come down here and look at what's going on in our, what, what, what this multiple regression is doing. And remember how I said we had this plane. 
All right, so essentially what we're doing is we have Dan sleep and baby sleep. And we're using both of those. All right, so here's Dan sleep. Up here is baby sleep. It's really hard to see this in 3D, right? Um, and using both of those to explain Dan's grumpiness. And so our model, rather than being a line, is actually, you can see, it's this plane. All right? And some of those dots come really close to the plane and kind of lie on it. Some of them are farther away. And you can see this little purple or blue line segment that goes from each dot. That's our observation in three space, right? And Dan sleep, Dan grump, baby sleep, down to where we would predict it to be, which is the plane. That distance, or basically you can see those blue lines or purple lines, whatever color they are, those are our residuals. So if I go something like this and I put Dan sleep here and Dan's grump over here, I can look at this right on its edge. That essentially gives me that kind of the, the our linear regression, the line of Dan sleep through um, Dan.grump. I can't do the same as easily with baby sleep and Dan.grump um, because the plane just doesn't go in the baby sleep direction. It's because basically the baby sleep is having very little influence over this plane here, right? So because its its coefficient is almost zero. But you can kind of see this is this is what I'm trying to get at, especially this idea of residuals. You know how I said basically when we talked about analysis of variance, it doesn't it's hard for me to talk about it because I don't have a good thing for you to grasp onto. Well, the same kind of thing is going on. In fact, for analysis of variance, you're using exactly the same mathematics inside um, to calculate all of that as you do um, for um, linear regression. In fact, it's it's exactly the same. Um, so uh, we can actually do everything that you can do with analysis of variance, you can do with linear regression. Um, in fact, you can probably do it better. All right, hopefully that makes some sense. If it doesn't, of course, make an appointment with me and I'll be happy to do that. We can slice this in kind of the 2D way. And in this case, Dan.sleep is almost, you know, totally dominates baby sleep in predicting. And we have this really strong linear relationship. It looks good, no problems. All right, the dots look linear, all that good stuff. But when we look at baby sleep, the actual regression line, all right, and this is the this is that function. So this if I were to look straight on edge with baby sleep down here and dan.grump over here, this is what I would see of that plane, right? It makes this line right straight through here. It doesn't really fit these dots because, well, baby sleep isn't really that explanatory over dan.grump. Okay, and so another way to look at this that doesn't get kind of lost in dimensions because we run into something called the curse of dimensionality. Let's say I had 10 explanatory variables, looking at 10 of these plots and thinking about trying to do a, ah, sorry, just a second, a 10 dimensional plot. I you know there's no way you could do this. This plot, this is as complicated as you can get, as complicated as a model as you can get and still be able to visualize it. Um, all right, but we can really collapse a lot of that down by looking at the actual versus fitted values. So we put actual values um, over here on the vertical axis. So this is what Dan's actual grumpiness, the fitted values here. And basically this line that's going through here is basically a line with an intercept of zero and a slope of one. And these dots should basically just be spread. I like to say butter on toast all around this line. And in this model, I mean, this model's textbook model, so it looks pretty well perfect. Okay, in the next lecture, we will talk a little bit more about some of the diagnostics behind this model, asking the question, well, is this model stupid? Basically, the way you want to do, I like to do um, data analysis, is start by looking at the data, take into account the theory to build a model, build a model, and then take that model and do everything in your, your power to break it. All right, test it every single way that you possibly can. And when you've tested it every single way you possibly think that you can do so, then you probably have a pretty good model. All right, so we'll talk to you next lecture.